Hi, my name's Will Crombie from The Organic Compound. I'm a farmer and filmmaker that's dedicated to the regenerative agriculture movement. And you're about to see another episode of Regeneration Conversations. This episode features Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute and Pat Kerrigan from Organic Consumers Association. Both of these two are fierce regenerators. Them and their organizations have been working for decades to educate farmers, consumers, and work with brands to bring on a healthy future. So check out this episode. So regenerative is what we were all talking about these days. Bringing regenerative leaders together. And this story about regenerative and regeneration. This is a discussion we need to have and information we need to get out to other farmers. Patrick, I'm Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute. I'm the chief executive officer there, and I've been mm -hmm. there a long time, almost like 44 years now, wow. working in the area of regenerative, regenerative organic agriculture. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it today. Fan fantastic. I'm Pat Kerrigan with Organic Consumers Association and with Regeneration Midwest. We're working on connecting up regenerative farmers and ranchers, building the movement for uh, uh, the, the regenerative food soil health building uh, and all the benefits that come with it and supporting the development of the regenerative foods marketplace. Well, I'm really looking to our conversation today about how the work that we've been doing can be uh, uh, launch this initiative and, and, and incentivize farmers to change. It's a very positive story, and there's good science behind it, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. So I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about the term regenerative agriculture. Yeah, the Rodale Institute's been involved in organic agriculture for over seven decades, and this story about regeneration, regenerative agriculture, and regenerative organic agriculture is really a story that's decades in the making. G.I. Rodale, our founder, started talking about organic agriculture back in the late 1930s, early 40s, uh, long before it was really had, had a strong meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've grown to the point now where we have a, a USDA certification seal for the word organic, and we have some mm -hmm. standard around what that word means, not just in the United States, but globally, so that trade can take place. And we've seen when that happens, uh, the trade expands, and yeah. it's been growing rapidly. But in the process of, of kind of giving that standard over to, and that word over to the USDA and to uh, government agencies around the world, mm -hmm. uh, you give something up. And Bob Rodale, back in the late 1970s, was already concerned about what was happening with that sort of giving up of the word. You, you lose some control. Mm -hmm. And in the process, uh, we think that we lost some, uh, some terminology around that, the word organic, things like continuous improvement, mm -hmm. things that the USDA didn't want to try to certify with, um, soil improvement and soil health concepts around animal welfare that's a hot topic right now even yeah. within the organic community and then this whole idea about social justice which in the organic industry was always sort of presumed to be part of it but there's no language in our standards around mm -hmm. that so bob rodell started talking again as early as the late 70s early 80s about this word regenerative most of the industry not just the organic industry but industries in general started flocking to the word sustainable and sustainability mm -hmm. But the word sustainable is kind of a weak word, and, and Bob Rodell mm -hmm. never really liked it. He said, oh, you, with that in agriculture, all you're trying to do is hold on to what you've got, you know? And, yeah. and most uh, conventional farms aren't even doing that. So he was concerned about that, and he was looking for another word. He spent a mm -hmm. lot of time formulating ideas and concepts around words, and he sort of landed on this word regenerative agriculture yeah. as it pertains to organic. He always linked those words together, so it was always regenerative, mm -hmm. organic in his mind. Sometimes he'd talk about just regenerative, sometimes organic, and he used mm -hmm. them interchangeably. But he really, in his, you can see that in his writings, but he really believed that this idea of regenerative organic agriculture um, was important to him. He was an early proponent of, of the conversation around climate change, mm -hmm. and he really believed that if we could improve the health of the soil, if organic agriculture has the power to improve the health of the soil, then it can improve the health of communities, it can improve yeah. the spirit of farmers, it mm -hmm. can improve many things that, mm -hmm. that surround agriculture, all mm -hmm. stemming from the way we manage soil. Yes. And so he launched into that conversation, and I, I think it's really fascinating that the rest of the world is sort of catching up to that now, mm -hmm. partly because the word sustainable has lost its meaning in the marketplace, and mm -hmm. people are confused by what it means. It, it means everything, and it means nothing. 
both at the same time. But this word regeneration and regenerative agriculture is catching on, and we couldn't be more excited at the Institute about that, about how that's happening. Fantastic. The intersection of regenerative and organic. Now, um, uh, organic farmers are the ones that have uh, been responsible uh, and done such a great job in educating Absolutely. consumers about the health, the health of everything, the soil, their livestock, the plants, and then their family, mm -hmm. you know, that are consuming the food. Regenerative, um, my boss, Ronnie Cummins, says, uh, regenerative is the next stage of organic. Yeah. And so for organic, what does ad adapting, adopting these regenerative practices look like and how is Rodale helping um, that to happen? Yeah, you guys are absolutely correct. It's, it, it's really about thinking about organic and all the great work that's happened under that label and under that, that set of rules and regulations uh, is, is great but it's sort of limiting because the standard is not very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Once you give it to the federal government, it's, it's, it's a baseline and it's a standard by which we can work from, yeah. but there's no incentive to get better than that. And we know right. as organic farmers, um, many organic farmers go far beyond what the standard mm -hmm. says in terms of their, their work in soil health improvement or, or working with the animals that are, that are connected to their farm. Yeah. So the Rodale Institute has worked with a bunch of brands from around the, the country and around the world to create an international global standard for the word regenerative as it pertains to agriculture. And we've linked mm -hmm. it to the word organic. Working with the USDA, uh, hand in glove, we've, uh, we've designed this standard so that farmers have something they can work to, but it's a standard that uh, infers continuous improvement. So it's a dynamic. Yes. It's uh -huh. always growing and improving. And I think mm -hmm. the, uh, the consuming public is really looking for that in the marketplace because they don't want to have to decide between a product that meets an animal welfare standard and a product that's certified organic. Mm. You know, they're saying well, both those values are important mm -hmm. to me in the marketplace. Can't we find a way to put that together under one sort of uh, logo or seal that mm -hmm. says the idea of soil health and sequestering carbon as a consumer is important to me, but so is getting the chemicals out of the food. And, and that's what Regenerative Organic does. It, it marries all of that together. And, and that's what's really exciting about it. Fantastic. I was thinking, uh, I love that term and the concept, continuous improvement. Yeah. You know, the, the Moses conferences that I would go to in the 80s when I was working on uh, um, uh, produce in Minneapolis at a, a food co-op, that it was farmers sitting around talking about how do we build our soil? You know, yeah. how do we promote biodiversity, the cornerstones of the Organic Food Production Act, right. you know? And so, um, so anyway, what I was thinking then is in terms of for the consumer looking to uh, purchase the product that, that addresses in, uh, the health of, of, of all and, and, and helps keep these uh, often, in often cases, family farmers on the land, how do, how do they distinguish their product on the food shelves and how do we engage consumers who 80% um, of the food that they, can, uh, that they um, uh, are consuming is what they're purchasing at, at supermarkets. So how do we get supermarkets on board the regenerative bandwagon? Well, I mean, th this is all brand new, so it's yes. going to be fun to watch this unfold, not just in the marketplace, but in consumers' minds, on social media. How do people mm -hmm. communicate around this new language, these new mm -hmm. words that we're starting to use? Um, we're, we're fairly confident that consumers want to support the type of agriculture that we're talking about. The, the fear, of course, that we have is, and we've seen it already in the marketplace, where there are corporations that are using the word regenerative uh, in, in connection with agriculture in a way that's really sort of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't really change much. They may sequester a little more carbon and they go, well, that's good enough. And we're saying, no, there's really more to it. And mm -hmm. consumers are in the driver's seat. That's the beauty of this. Uh, and, and again, why we've linked it to the word organic, because we've all spent decades working in this world of organic agriculture, building the word up in the marketplace, and we don't want to lose that momentum right. or that structure. Yes. So we want to capitalize on that, mm -hmm. but then go to the next level, take it even even higher, even better. And we know that that's what consumers want. They want yeah. to know that uh, the food that they're purchasing 
really not only supports their own personal health, but mm -hmm. supports the health of the environment, uh, improving biodiversity, improving soil health, yeah. uh, and improving not just that, but, the, but the, the livelihood and the dynamic culture that farmers bring to the table. Nobody wants to see that disappear either. That right. whole idea of family farms and, and people out on the land producing the food, healthy food for people and taking care of the soil at the same time. It's, it's just a beautiful picture. And I think probably number one for me is keeping small farmers on the land. Yeah. And, and figuring out how to help these farmers um, uh, not only build their soil health, but they're not going to be able to do that if they're not if they're uh, if they lose the farm, which is so crushing. The, the The number of farm suicides in in Minnesota and the Midwest is I can't even think about too much because it hurts too much. Yeah. you know what I mean to think about those families. So, um, w where, where then does Rodale fit in, in terms of, I was thinking like with the f amazing field trial work that you all are doing, um, in helping um, farmers adopt regenerative practices, and then how do we help them get that premium, uh, figure out new markets, agroforestry, silvopasture, into row crop production, whatever. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, Jeff, on where we need to go as a community, as an as a organic and re regenerative community in best helping these farmers that care so much for the land and for the livestock and the health of the people consuming the foods they produce. Well, you bring up a good point. Rodale Institute is a science-based organization, so mm -hmm. we are a research and education facility. Farmers need to know that there's good science behind the decisions that we're asking them as consumers mm -hmm. to make when their livelihood depends on it. Mm -hmm. They can't afford to make a whole lot of mistakes uh, because of the economics of, of agriculture, and they need to know that science is behind these decisions. Uh, we need to know that particularly if we're going to not necessarily pay more for food, but pay farmers for uh, eco-services that they might mm -hmm. be providing. And the far small family farms, not just in the United States, but around the world, are the most efficient tool that we have for providing those, those eco-services. If we're going to support farmers financially to do that, we want to know that there's good science behind that, that what we're putting money into, the practices that we're asking them to implement, actually do sequester more carbon, mm -hmm. actually do help keep the water clean, actually do mm -hmm. help uh, drive the economics of a, of a rural community so that we can uh, build that up and, and, and empower those folks who live in those communities. Again, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Because whatever happens again in the United States, we see it happening everywhere else, mm -hmm. too. It's mm -hmm. not just a, a U.S. situation. So we're excited that, that we can play a role in bringing that science and educational piece, not just to farmers, but to consumers as well, so mm -hmm. that everybody uh, is, has a transparent picture of what this l looks like. We don't have hidden science like the conventional right. chemical industry does, where they go, oh, well, yeah, we forgot to tell you that, or we didn't, you know, the farmers who are applying the pesticides have a higher rate of cancer than the general population. Mm -hmm. They have lower sperm counts than yeah. the general population. Um, that's not what people want to support in the marketplace, uh, but they need to know that there's scientific proof and good evidence that changing to a, a different system can correct some of those problems. Right, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then um, I, I'd love to ask a, a personal question, if I could, which is what got you interested in the soil, uh, in organic foods? And you, could you just say a little bit about your story of how you came to, to be leading Rodale Institute? Well, sure. I mean, I think uh, there, there's millions of farmers that could sit in this very seat and have a great personal story about how they mm -hmm. got to where they are. We all have those that, that history and that story. Um, my, my love affair with agriculture and, and soil really grew out of the back to the land movement at the tail end of the, the counterculture of the 60s. I was too young to participate in that counterculture, but just the right age to sort of dive into the back to the land movement of the yes. early 70s. And uh, my wife and I bought a piece of land before we were married. We still live on that piece of land and we've grown that. And where's now. that? That's in Pennsylvania, southeastern uh -huh. Pennsylvania, where the world headquarters for Rodale Institute mm -hmm. is. So I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to uh, get a job and start with Rodale Institute way back in 1975. So wow. here we are. 44 years later, um, still trying to, to do that work. And, and being able to be part of this community and watch the industry grow and mature over those decades has just been extremely rewarding. Seeing farms that, you talked about suicide. I mean, we all, those of us in the farm community, all personally know families that were touched either 
by that decision or the conversations around that decision and mm -hmm. and seeing those farmers that then transition to organic and their life turns around and they are you know they may not be wildly successful economically but at least they're making a living mm -hmm. and it's it's improved the quality of their life being part of that conversation and part of that journey has just been fascinating fantastic and then uh the other thing i'd love to have you touch on jeff when I was out at the National Organic Standards Board meeting in Pittsburgh this fall, the uh, the mixer that uh, that happens at every NSB um, was hosted by Pennsylvania Certified Organic, and they were talking mm -hmm. about right. the amazing collaborative partnership, which I haven't seen anything like this anywhere else in the United States, as far as with the support of the governor, um, working with, with businesses, with uh, the Rodale Institute, and helping farmers transition, uh, conventional farmers transition to organic. Can you tell our audience about that? Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to hear your, your perspective on, on what that means across other states, because Pennsylvania is a, a, a unique state. We yes. have a real... Uh, we got two major cities with Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, but we mm -hmm. have a lot of rural areas in between. And so our um, our House of Representatives and our Senate are both controlled by the Republicans, but our governor is a Democrat. So <clears throat> it's rather unique in that uh, working with our, our Democratic governor, we asked him to sort of take a look at agriculture and make it mm -hmm. a focal point for his administration, knowing that Pennsylvania is an agricultural state and we grow and can produce just about any food crop uh, other than citrus and bananas. Uh, and is in, the in second largest organic producer in the country. That, that like, shocked me. That's California. what really caught his attention when we were able to, to tell him, look, we're number two in the nation. And if you look at it by size or population, we're number one. California is just so big compared yeah. to Pennsylvania. Um, we said, what can we do to encourage more farmers to transition to organic? Well, the governor picked up on that concept and really ran with it. And what he noted was, we have a farm bill in Washington, D.C. We have a national farm bill that really has a, 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 hard, a big fingerprint and handprint mm -hmm. on agriculture across the, the United States. But he noticed that there are no states that have state farm bills. So in June of 2019, Pennsylvania, with a, at the leadership of a Democrat and a, and a Republican-controlled House and Senate, passed the very first state farm bill in the nation. So Pennsylvania Congratulations, now has a state. Yeah, brother. Ex exciting. <laughs> and one of the pillars of that farm bill was a transition to organic and regenerative organic agriculture. As the state looked at that and said, this isn't a partisan decision. Uh, this, mm -hmm. is, this is an idea of how do we preserve and save uh, the family farms in Pennsylvania, how do we make them profitable? Noting that there is a, the marketplace does reward farmers that transition to organic. How can mm -hmm. we, we then give them the services and the uh, support that they need to right. make that transition because it's a big change mm -hmm. for farmers to do on their own. So mm -hmm. um, working with Rodale Institute, we now have a, a consulting business within Pennsylvania. So with the state's leadership, we're able to put a private uh, individual consultant in the kitchen of every farm in Pennsylvania, wow. offering them free services to transition to organic. It's, it's amazing, fantastic. We've got, mm. so far we have 22,000 acres uh, under management that are moving in that direction in, in only eight months. So yeah. that's that's pretty amazing and pretty impressive as we're we're launching and, and moving that forward. But how do you see that playing out in other states? Maybe you could well, interject there. At OCA, we always want to identify the best practices and then how to replicate them. Um, and so w w one thing I'm thinking of is we need to help you tell this amazing story and when i heard it i just was like oh and this is the best news of the entire year and i get to great hear great news every day from my job literally yeah. as far as reading about what's happening in the in minnesota the midwest the u.s mm -hmm. and, the, and the rest of the world around um yeah around minnesota should have a state farm bill i think we the, should the secretary of agriculture i'm gonna be having that conversation yeah. when i you know next week in fact with, the, with with some people i think that can help move this I think the uh, Secretary of Agriculture said so far 13 states have reached out to Pennsylvania and say, how did, wow. you, how did you do this? How do you bring the farm community on board? How do you bring universities on board, uh, nonprofits, 
Uh, so let's have a and, and let's have a national that oh, sorry. let's have that conversation. Yeah, let's have a national conference. And here's the model. Here's and then hear from um, state leaders, organic farmers, um, politicians. Um, here's the that. challenges. Here's here's what we need. You know, and it's like this is this is like so exciting. It's so it's so what's needed. And um, and let's work on this one, you know, because uh, the, with with these thirteen states, I'd love to be talking with these folks. And what what would this look like in your state? And what do you right. what are the tools and resources and finances and have to come to that the you table need to make this a success? Yes, and right. and where's the political force to push legislators? This is where we need to go, and we need to go there quickly. Yeah, and I building think, our soil. I think we had 95 farmers so far reach out to us. That's 95 farmers who are thinking about organic, but so, saw no path forward. Yes. But now, with a little bit of support uh, from the state, and, and and not even just support, but just sort of giving the concept of transitioning to organic real relevance and saying it's okay to do this. Mm -hmm helps people to move forward and hopefully into a much more regenerative and successful enterprise. Yes, and, if, and if I could use just Minnesota as an example, Carmen Fernholz is one of my biggest heroes. Yeah. Small grain farmer. I know Carmen. North, yeah, yeah, and Carmen is the one that brought, or he is the organic ambassador for the University of Minnesota. Yeah. And the seeds that he planted, I got to see at the Greenland's Blue Waters Forever Green Initiative wow. presentation that the university did, talking about these amazing partnerships for, uh, for uh, protecting water quality, building soil health, marketing kinds of products, you know? And Carmen is one amazing example of, how, of the impact that a, per, a farmer can have. And you know what? We need Carmen Fernholzes in every state. We do. And I can't wait to talk to him. I've been on Carmen's and farm. And get his and, ideas yeah, on. I agree. I mean, I want to clone him, but that's not possible <laughs> yet, you know? But I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Yeah. You know? Yeah, how do we move that forward? I know there's ways to do it. I know the will is there. Uh, the, the support in the farm community is there. Yeah. And I think, you know, from the, from the work we've been doing with Regenerative Organic, it, with the brands that we're working with, I th the, we suspect that the will of the consumer is there to support that kind mm -hmm. of work. And the energy is there. Mm -hmm. And speaking of brands, that's something I talk. I've been talking about a lot at this conference. Is how can brands help drive the regenerative movement? We we have um, uh, Dr. McCuller, Dr. Bronner's, Patagonia. Right. You know, it's like nonprofits are doing incredibly mm. important work. I keep going to the same suppliers, and we need to grow this pie rather than competing. You know, for the for the for how big of a slice we can get. And I think about this all the time. So, could you just share as far as with brands and the role that regenerative brands can play in in building soil soil health, supporting the farmers, educating the consumers? Yeah, the brands, some of that you mentioned, Dr. Bronner's great friend of the Rodale Institute, uh, Patagonia, the same mm -hmm. thing, and, and many others. <clears throat> They're not soil scientists, mm -hmm. but their customers understand that if we don't protect the soil and improve its health, our success as a species is limited. Yeah. Uh, we, we're limiting ourselves and our own success. And, and, and they're really the voice that we have in the marketplace mm -hmm. because groups like uh, the Organic Consumers Association or Rodale Institute don't really have brand products sitting on kitchen tables in pantries or hanging in closets. Mm -hmm. uh, but the food and fiber industry does. And we, need, we knew early on at Rodale that we had to work with those brands to, mm -hmm. to expand the voice more rapidly and get that message out to the consumers who are purchasing the product. Mm -hmm. And our... Um, uh, I, I think our ability is just magnified many times over by working with brands, showing that it's not about Rodale necessarily. It's not about regenerative organic. It's about this partnership and these relationships that can move the conversation forward faster. Right on. And, and if, if I could ask a piece of advice from you, how would you suggest Organic Consumers Association in reaching out to these regenerative brands, working with their mar marketing departments, telling the stories of how their farmers are improving their soil health, what that means for the consumer, why that's worth the extra uh, cost it might be. I'll, I got a million well, other well, this, this is the perfect venue. What yeah. we're doing right here, we know that video is a powerful tool. Yeah. We know these conversations go viral and, to, and and leap forward into the uh, into the uh, 
uh, stratosphere as people communicate and use mm -hmm. this and, and tweet and retweet and Instagram mm -hmm. and re-Instagram these mm -hmm. messages. Uh, and I think that's really an important piece of, of work that you're already doing. So right. I, I applaud you for that. What is a brand that you're working with that is really championing regenerative agriculture? Um, is, is there any that come to mind that, uh, that uh, their work we can uh, uh, hopefully uh, encourage other brands to replicate it. Well, sure. I mean, I, and I don't want to discount any of the mm -hmm. multiple of 42 brands that have already signed oh, on okay. yeah, uh -huh. with the Regenerative Organic Alliance, uh -huh. which is the uh, nonprofit that we created to, to or helped create to support and house this conversation around regenerative mm -hmm. organic. Uh, but that's really been led by Dr. Bronner's and Patagonia, two mm -hmm. companies mm -hmm. that don't just talk about it, but they live and breathe it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's at the very core of who they are as a, as a corporation. So they're not a group that's been doing something in a different direction for many years and now we're trying to capture uh, right. uh, uh, the market share uh, short term. They're in it for the long haul. They have mm -hmm. been for uh, decades. And having folks like that uh, to be in the car and in the driver's seat with us yeah. has just been a really powerful tool and we couldn't do it without them regenerative agriculture uh while the term is r relatively new you know in our uh uh building upon the work of the uh organic pioneers such as robert rodell it's actually concepts and practices that have been an indigenous part of growing food with respect and care right. for the earth i think what we're doing is we're trying to marry what indigenous people did mm -hmm. with what modern science can bring to the table so mm -hmm. that we can move forward uh, in a way that respects and, and, and cherishes the soil that we use, mm -hmm. doesn't just deplete it or degrade it. Right, that we're borrowing. <laughs> and I think if we do that, what we're seeing at Rodell Institute and what we see when we talk to people about this message all across the country and around the world is that it energizes people. So this mm -hmm. is a real positive force. Yes. I think that's what's exciting yep. about regenerative organic Nobody gets up in the morning and says, boy, I, I hope I can make my soil less healthy today. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's some common ground that we can all begin to work on, move the needle forward. It's, it's a positive story. It's positive energy. So much of what we hear in the news media is about soil degradation, water contamination, mm -hmm. air pollution, mm -hmm. uh, suicide among farmers. All this is really negative and depressing energy. And here we have some tools that we're bringing to the table, uh, some energy we're bringing to the table that's really positive. And we're seeing... Um, Farmers from every spectrum getting behind this message and saying, there's a way that I can get behind this and push and make it successful. Whether it's on the indigenous side, on the conventional side, mm -hmm. as they begin to try to reduce their, their dependence on chemicals and move in a more regenerative direction. Uh, you know, regeneration and regenerative agriculture is a journey. It's not a destination. Right. So we're, we're all getting in that journey and moving in a positive direction, and that's what's really exciting to me. Uh, and what a sacred journey we're on, brother. And it's great having you as Thank a partner. God. Thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate your time thanks, today. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, me. Thanks for joining us. Another great regeneration conversation. I want to thank these two from the bottom of my soil loving heart for sitting down and having this talk and for all of the work that they do to push this regenerative conversation forward. I love that question. Who are your favorite brands? Who are your favorite regenerative farmers? What's their story? We need to be telling those stories and sharing this message with the world. So please share this video, tag your favorite farmers, tag your favorite brands, and let's just keep it up, keep it moving. I'm Will Crombie from The Organic Compound. Thanks so much. Peace.